Hello and welcome to The Nexus. The year is almost over and today we are looking back at some of our most popular stories of 2023. And here they are, in reverse order. In at three, on the trail of Andrew Tate, arrested in Romania. The Matrix has attacked me. We visited his jail and took a look around his compound. All the doors seemed to be shut until his lawyer gave us this exclusive interview. Are you talking about the real Andrew Tate on those videos? And, or are you talking about a character? A lot of people are posting content on the internet just to sell an image. At two, aliens exist and we have their bodies and spacecraft. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. You're kidding. No. America's top UFO lobbyist tells us why the US president is about to reveal once and for all aliens do exist. But first, one of the most unique stories we've ever covered here on the Nexus, the implosion of the Titan submersible. Our coverage of the tragedy was watched well over one and a half million times on YouTube and is now our most watched show ever. The story centers around Dr. Rush, the maverick businessman who designed the Titan. Hi, my name is Stockton Rush. I'm the CEO and founder of OceanGate. Let's take a look at Titan. Almost exactly a year ago, Stockton Rush showed off his sub to Canadian reporters. It had already made a handful of trips down to the Titanic, and Rush was in confident mood. And it's meant for a 16-year-old to throw it around, and super durable. We keep a couple of spares on board just in case. And this is the Titan now, nothing more than debris, recovered from the ocean floor. Among the wreckage, the remains of the five people aboard its final voyage, including two billionaires. 58-year-old Hamish Harding and 48-year-old Shazada Dawood, accompanied by his 19-year-old son, Suleiman, whose mother had given him her place on the sub. So it was supposed to be Shazada and I going down. Um, and then I stepped back and gave the space to Suleiman because he really wanted to go. Also on board, the 77-year-old explorer, Paul-Henri Nagiolet, and of course, 61-year-old Rush himself, who was piloting the sub. Descended from two of America's founding fathers, Richard Stockton and Benjamin Rush, he had high ambitions. His dream of becoming an astronaut, perhaps even one of the first people on Mars, was ended by his poor eyesight. He turned his attention to the deep sea instead, pioneering private ocean exploration. A trip on board his Titan submersible would cost a quarter of a million dollars, taking the super rich to the wreckage of the Titanic. That was the supposedly unsinkable ship at the time the world's largest, which hit an iceberg on its maiden voyage in 1912. The wreckage lies in a remote part of the North Atlantic, around 700 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, and about 2,000 kilometers from its ultimate destination, New York. Clients take an eight-day trip, setting sail from the Canadian coast on a chartered support ship. And from there, depending on the weather, four of the days would be used to dive to the Titanic. The wreckage lies almost four kilometers below the surface, well below the distance a person, a military submarine, or even a whale can dive to. Such a depth requires an incredibly well-designed machine to withstand the pressure about 380 times the pressure we experience on the surface. Equivalent to having the Eiffel Tower pressing down on it. Deep sea experts warned that Stockton Rush had avoided certifying the craft because of numerous flaws. There are only 10 vehicles in the whole world that can go 4,000 meters or deeper, and all of them are certified, except the Titan. The body was mostly made from carbon fiber, Rush claimed he had bought it from Boeing at a big discount because it was past its shelf life for use in airplanes, something not recommended by experts, including the Hollywood director, James Cameron, who has dived down to the Titanic wreckage 30 times in a self-designed sub. So it, we always understood that this was the wrong material for submersible hulls because with each pressure cycle, you can have progressive damage. So it's, it's quite insidious because you may have a number of successful dives, which is what happened here, and then have it fail later. And the nose cone was made from titanium, despite expert advice not to mix the two materials. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. Um, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. 
And you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me, the carbon fiber and titanium. There's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. According to a former employee who sued the company, the single window in the craft was only rated to 1,300 meters, around a third of the depth necessary to reach the shipwreck. Passengers were locked in by 18 bolts, hand tightened by someone on the outside of the vehicle. It seems like a lot of the way you made this is by taking off the shelf parts and sort of MacGyvering them together. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Does that not raise anybody's eyebrows in the industry? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, I'm definitely an outlier. There were a lot of rules out there that didn't make engineering sense to me. There are certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down, and that's the pressure vessel. Once the pressure vessel is, you're certain it's not going to collapse on everybody, everything else can fail. Mr. Rush had been warned his submarine was unsafe and could damage the reputation of the entire field of deep sea exploration. Five years ago, in an email exchange with Rob McCallum, a leading deep sea expert, Mr. Rush wrote that he had grown tired of industry players who tried to use a safety argument to stop innovation. We have heard the baseless cries of, you are going to kill someone way too often. I take this as a serious personal insult. Mr. McCallum replied, I think you are potentially placing yourself and your clients in a dangerous dynamic. Ironically, in your race to the Titanic, you are mirroring that famous catch cry, she is unsinkable. But Stockton Rush pressed on regardless, ending in a tragedy we now know the story of all too well. We spoke to John Copley, an eminent marine biologist who 10 years ago descended 5,000 meters into the Caribbean Sea on a scientific expedition. That's considerably deeper than the Titanic. We asked him how he would explain what happened to the Titan. What happened to the Titan submersible is unprecedented. There's never before been a deep diving submersible that has imploded during a dive. And these vehicles are not new, okay? The first vehicle that carried people into the deep ocean uh, did so nearly a century ago um, in 1930. Uh, and over those many decades, these kinds of vehicles have taken far more people into the depths of the ocean than the number of people who've ever been into space. Uh, and no vehicle has ever imploded before. So it was a completely unprecedented incident. The investigation that's being led by the Coast Guard will now have to establish or exactly what happened. And there are certainly three areas that they will be investigating. What was different about the Titan, first of all, um, is its shape. So most of the vehicles that carry people into the deep ocean, the part that carries the people is a sphere uh, because that round shape means that the pressure is spread evenly around the hull, which is the best shape for pressure. Uh, but the Titan was different. Um, for the Titan, they split the sphere in half and inserted a tube in between the two halves to make more room for more people. We have Bart Kemper with us. He's a submarine engineer who warned OceanGate years ago that the design of the Titan was seriously flawed. Bart Kemper, um, you co-wrote a letter along with the Marine Technology Society to Stockton Rush five years ago, uh, stating uh, that you and the others were worried that OceanGate's experimental approach could lead to catastrophic outcomes with serious consequences for the entire industry. Uh, what was it at the time, five years ago now, uh, that worried you and your, your fellow experts from the Marine Technology Society? Well, the primary thing was that OceanGate decided not to go with codes and standards, did not go with classification societies. This is the due diligence that we expect, this standard of care. The, all these codes and standards that have been developed for submersibles has been done with decades and decades of experience. Classification societies have trained engineers that work with the client and get and get their designs validated, even if there's novel items. So that's when you don't do that, then all you have is self-certification. And self-certification in any engineering endeavor is questionable at best. And if you are putting people's lives at risk is unacceptable. You, ha you have to do something beyond that. 
And what happened to the letter? Well, the issue with the letter was that the Marine Technology Society is just that, a technology society, much like American Society of Mechanical Engineers and any other things. If they start getting into trying to regulate how businesses operate, they run afoul in the United States with antitrust laws. You, you can't operate that way. However, the act of the Will Conan, who was the chairman, bringing these people together and having these very pointed discussions it, when when the letter did not go forward, resulted in Will Conan and other individuals going to have a face to face with OceanGate and trying to resolve some issues. Some issues they they understood, they agreed with, okay, and they changed how they were I'll, operating. I'll get other to that. ones they did not. I'll get to that in a second. But why wasn't the letter actually delivered to Stockton Rush and OceanGate? Because it was on the Marine Technology Society letterhead. And that organization cannot, because of antitrust laws and other issues with that, they cannot get in and try to regulate how businesses operate. So it was outside their charter and could have been a source of legal problems. Okay, so they, they changed their mind and they decided to have a face-to-face. -face. Some members went to see Stockton Rush. How did that meeting go down? The way the meeting worked out is they agreed to some things. Um, they agreed to make the waiver much more explicit to make it very clear this is not a tourist sub there are tourist subs this is not a tourist sub this is an experimental similar to the faa experimental aircraft where you g get into it you use it with with assuming full risk that it has uh that it, that is just exactly what it says experimental mm. so that that part was changed and they made it more clear in their advertising they made it more clear in their agreements and they changed their their way of operating instead of saying passengers that they were going to have people who would come on as mission specialists and be trained to do specific tasks for that dive mission. On to our second story now. And the former U.S. Air Force intelligence officer, David Grush, made the sensational claim that America had recovered alien bodies and spacecraft. He told the same thing to Congress. Well, this story struck a chord with Nexus viewers on YouTube where our program has now been watched over 1.2 million times. Here's a reminder of why they love this story. You are saying to the human race, for the first time, an official intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. We're definitely not alone. UFOs exist. The U.S. government found quite a number of them, and they are indeed of non-human origin. The whistleblower's shocking new claims about our country's research into UFOs. The bombshell claim about UFOs. A former U.S. intelligence official and Air Force veteran claims a top secret program is withholding evidence of alien spacecraft. David Grush. Let's, let's find out who he is and what his uh, credentials were. He's a decorated veteran. He's described as beyond reproach. It's not just him. It's multiple intelligence officials who have reported on this to Congress. He essentially said that they are illegally hiding it from Congress and they are illegally hiding it from the American people, but they have off-world off craft in possession. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. You're kidding. No. I thought it was totally nuts, and I thought at first I was being deceived. It was a ruse. People started confiding in me. They approached me. I have plenty of current and former senior intelligence officers that came to me many of which I knew almost my whole career, that confided in me they were a part of a program. They named the program. I've never heard of it. And they, they told me, based on their oral testimony, um, and they provided me documents and other, other proof. If you're right, if you're telling us the truth, mm -hmm. everyone, the entire American public, has been lied to for decades. Yeah, there's a sophisticated uh, disinformation campaign targeting the U.S. populace, which is extremely unethical and immoral. Do we have bodies? Do we have species of well, non Well, naturally, um, when you recover something that's either landed or crashed, um, sometimes you encounter um, dead pilots. And 
Uh, believe it or not, as, fan as fantastical as that sounds, it's true. Stephen, do you, simply, do you believe David Grush? I have high confidence that what he's saying is correct. We know quite a bit about his efforts to come forward, filing a complaint with the IG office, the DOD, or the IG at the Intel, Intel offices. Um, I, I know the attorney involved. He uh, has been trying to come forward for some time, but he has been patient to a degree. But ultimately, he had to, uh, to get aggressive because he was getting death threats and other problems because he had come out uh, within government, but still there were people in government that didn't like that. This is one of the reasons why recent legislation in the Senate, uh, which was eventually signed by the president, called for more protection for witnesses, uh, including uh, a paragraph indicating that they could sue the government. Now, that was taken out of that legislation before it was signed by the president. We have been heading towards hearings, most likely, hopefully, in the Senate Intelligence Committee, chaired by Mark Warner. There are a number of witnesses, well over a dozen, maybe more, who have been interviewed by Arrow. We think they've been interviewed by members of the staff. And he might well have been one of those witnesses. Uh, he, but he has jumped the gun, you might say. Uh, he, he lost patience and was concerned for his safety. And so he went public with the assistance of journalist Wesley Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. Mm. They approached uh, significant entities like the Post and the Times, but they simply couldn't take on a story that big in that uh, quick of time. So they went to the debrief, they went to News Nation and put it out. Uh, but I, I'm quite sure that when the Senate hearings begin, and they could be called at any time, he will be, along with quite a few other military witnesses, a witness, and he will say under oath that while working for the task force, he talked with individuals who do work in those programs who cannot come forward, and he will give that testimony. And eventually, those people, the ones that he talked to, that worked in those programs, they will also be sitting in front of the Intel Committee, and mm. they will tell us directly. If and the so government, I have complete confidence in this. Just quickly, if the government is trying to cover everything up and has been uh, heading a disinformation campaign for many, many years, why do they give him mm -hmm. authority to talk about it now? Yes. The, the, the truth embargo, as I call it, it's not a cover-up, it's a truth embargo, is essentially over. The stigma is gone. The media is, is, is producing thousands of articles. There's been legislation three consecutive years. The truth embargo on the ET presence is essentially coming to an end. I expect hearings very soon, and I expect the President of the United States to confirm to uh, the American people and the world that we are engaged with non-human intelligence or extraterrestrials, whatever you want to call them. That should happen this summer. David Grush has played a role. He got out ahead of things a little bit. Right. Concerned for his safety. I don't have a problem with that. Now, our final story is about Andrew Tate, the influencer who was arrested exactly a year ago. He and his brother Tristan were taken from his residence just outside of the Romanian capital, Bucharest, and thrown into jail. Prosecutors suspect them of human trafficking and other offences. We deployed a few days later and tried to interview him in prison. The guards were polite, but ultimately it was a no. A quick look round Tate's residence, where he was arrested a couple of weeks before, confirmed his supercar collection was depleted and more would be confiscated in the coming months. Later, we managed to speak to his lawyer, Eugene Vadiniak, in an interview that quickly went viral. Now, your client, Andrew Tate, is accused of human trafficking and forming an organized crime group. Is that true? Is that what they've been doing here in Romania? Our client, my clients, don't recognize the allegations against them and their positions in front of the prosecutors and in front of the judge were not to recognize these felonies that uh, pretending to be done by, by them. And they support us as a team of lawyers with all the proofs and evidences is needed to prove their innocency. The prosecutor says six alleged victims uh, were found, or women, at the Tate properties. Now, were these women being held there and exploited? From our point of view and from the position explained by our client, I will say a definitely no. And as argument to my position is the fact that 
when the investigator came in the house of our clients, the doors were opened, all the girls had access to their own phone number, cellular data. If somebody is kept in a house against his will and he has his phone and he has the possibility to post on social media, on Instagram, to make TikTok content, to talk to the phone, has the same possibility to call 112. Or to May. just leave the house. Or to just leave the house Except because, sorry, because we have the evidences by the cameras from the house that the girls were alone in the house, that they uh, demand food at uh, the, uh, that or address, food. they were ordering food, they were visiting the town, the mall, they were making shopping together. But just because they have the ability to leave and to order food and go shopping, that doesn't mean that they're not being human trafficked. According to some experts, uh, Andrew Tate employs the lover boy method, which is to make the women fall in love with them, with make them uh, feel under his control, uh, to handle all of the finances, and make them dependent on him. Is it true that Andrew Tate has been employing the lover boy technique, which technically speaking is human trafficking? It's a pity that at this moment, legally speaking, because the investigation is not public, I am not allowed by the law to give more details. But I will give you that the, this lover boy method is not sustained by the evidences, and we have contrary evidences. And I am wondering, were all the girls so in love with Andrew Tate that all of the girls had their brain washed by this method of lover boy? But as his lawyer, are you aware of the numerous bits of video evidence that are out there on YouTube and elsewhere uh, where your client talks very explicitly about how he controls the women who work for him? It's very clear from the public record that he's already talked about the lover boy technique and how to control and manipulate these women. I don't know by heart all the videos of uh, Andrew Tate. We are now in a phase that we have to prepare other type of uh, def defendings for our clients. But I'm wondering myself, are you talking about the real Andrew Tate on those videos and, or are you talking about a character? Because from my point of view, as you know, nowadays a lot of people are posting content on the internet just to sell an image, a character. I am not sure that we are talking about the real person, Andrew Tate. In previous videos, uh, we have seen your client, Andrew Tate, uh, boasting of being able to pay off the Romanian uh, criminal justice system. So is that the intention for Andrew Tate now, now that he's actually, uh, you know, in, in jail? Is he going to try to buy off the Romanian criminal justice system? For sure, no. As a lawyer, I can say a big no. A big no. He's going to have to go through... And I don't want to answer, to comment anymore, because I don't know the statement of my client, this declaration of my client and... But again, you might think that that's just him playing a character. It's, it is possible. It is possible. Um, when your client was arrested, uh, he said very enigmatically, the Matrix has sent their agents <laughs> to get me. The Matrix has attacked me. Um, can you explain what he means by that? I also don't know. I heard the story of Matrix, but I don't know, I have a serious profession and I didn't ask my client about this metric story because I think that is about something on media platforms or internet platforms well, and I don't know about this story he, with Matrix. He thinks there is a global system that includes big tech and governments and so on uh, that is trying to control and inhibit the way pretty much everyone lives and that he has been targeted by them. Some people might even call it the deep state, if you like. Um, he has been targeted by them because he is trying to emancipate young men. Now, do you believe that as his lawyer? I don't believe that. 
and I think that if you are talking about my client beliefs, you should ask him at the proper time about this matter. This matter, it doesn't have to do anything with my activity as lawyer. Just a final question then. I know you visit your client uh, perhaps twice a day sometimes. Twice How twice. is Mr. Tate doing? He is not very well. He is disappointed, but uh, he is willing to, to resist and to, and to help the investigators to find the truth, to present all the evidences that he, he has in his favor, and he hopes that he will take part, uh, it will take uh, part of a fair trial. Well, that was a look back at some of our most interesting stories of 2023. I hope next year will be just as interesting. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the new year. Bye for now.